Uh, good evening and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Kevin Streeter. I'm the chair of the BCS Learning Development Specialist Group. Uh, just before we get started this evening, uh, I'm just going to run through a general introduction to the group. So if you haven't been to one of our events before, then uh, very pleased to have you with us tonight. And uh, uh, hopefully this will just give you a bit of background to the group uh, before we get started with our, our main talk in a few minutes. Uh, so the Learning Development Specialist Group is uh, a specialist group within BCS uh, membership for those that are involved in the development, delivery or management of learning to IT and communications professionals and users. Hopefully that's a very broad definition, but encompasses everyone that's interested in learning, uh, a practitioner in learning creation, learning delivery, or anything that's associated with uh, good practice in learning. So uh, I hope somewhere in that definition, uh, you can recognize something that uh, resonates with your interests. Uh, a couple of years ago, we did a survey of the, the membership. Um, we've got about around 1400 people in the group. Uh, so we asked what, what background, uh, where do you work? Um, and what's your interest in learning and development? Uh, and as you can see, we've got a complete range. We've got uh, a large number of people that are involved in IT end user training. And that can be anything from office applications, appli general application user training, uh, IT professional skills training, uh, which is very much the, the process world. So there's things like ITIL and uh, project management. Um, similar number of people involved in IT technical skills training. Uh, so these are people that are involved in the creation, development or delivery of technical training, uh, usually in the context of uh, vendor products uh, or something uh, more complex. Um, we have a good chunk of membership uh, are involved directly in the university or the education sector. So uh, I know we have a number of academics and uh, teachers of computing involved in the group. Uh, and then about a third of the group are people that just have a general interest in IT skills development topics and uh, very welcome to be part of the group. And, uh, and I hope that, that gives you a feel of the, the membership. A couple of things I just want to, to highlight uh, before we get started this evening. Uh, we have our own uh, web page on the BCS website uh, for the Learning Development Specialist Group. Uh, if you aren't a member of BCS or you're not a member of the, the Learning Development Specialist Group, then uh, you're very much welcome to be part of this group. Uh, if you want to find out more about either BCS or the Specialist Group itself, then uh, the link here uh, will take you to the page with all the information about us. Uh, I will post these links into the chat shortly. Uh, and uh, we've now started putting all our uh, his past sessions uh, onto the BCS member group's YouTube channel. And uh, uh, the one you can see highlighted is the 15 years of uh, education technology uh, that we, uh, we ran uh, last month uh, is on there. Um, and we're slowly putting together all the past content uh, that we can get our hands on. And uh, we'll be posting it into that playlist. So. Uh, if you've missed a session in the past, and uh, I know we've done some digital badging, some of the archives of IT, then uh, please go and have a look at the playlist and uh, see what's there and uh, hopefully find some topics of interest. And finally, just a, a mention of our future events. So our committee is working hard at uh, a range of number of events. Uh, we have a joint event with the Wiltshire branch uh, coming up on uh, August the 18th, uh, which Mark Palmer, one of our committee, uh, is a member of Wiltshire Branch, uh, and I believe he's going to be talking about apprenticeships. Um, August 25th, uh, we will have Ian Seward from the Sophia Foundation 
talking about Sophia 8 update process that's just started. Uh, September 23rd, we've got an event on uh, inclusive approaches to learning and development. And finally, uh, we have the BCS president this year, uh, Rebecca George, uh, is going to be coming to join us for our AGM, uh, hopefully on October the 21st, still, still to be confirmed. And uh, she's been very deeply involved in the T-level reforms. Uh, so she's come, going to come and talk to us about T-levels uh, in October. If you've got any other ideas, then please feel free to contact me and uh, always willing to take on board ideas or uh, if you want to get more involved in the group, then uh, please get in touch. Uh, always happy to talk to people that uh, have an interest in learning development. So that was the introduction. Uh, I can see we've got a good number of people online now. So very delighted to welcome John Kleeman uh, to talk to us tonight. Uh, John is uh, founder uh, of Question Mark, uh, which is one of the, the leading providers uh, of testing solutions. And uh, I recently heard John talk uh, about some of the privacy concerns and uh, thought that'd be a very good topic for tonight. So thank you very much to, for joining us tonight, John. Um, if you thank have you, any, questions, you, any questions, questions during the session please post them into the questions and we'll do a Q&A session at the end but thank you for joining and uh, I'll hand over to you John and uh, I think we'll make you presenter and uh, welcome to the group. Thank you Kevin and it's uh, very good to be here and uh, good, e good evening everyone. Uh, so uh, if you can make me presenter I will share my screen. Yeah. Uh... Uh, should be with you now, John. Yes. So, uh, just checking, you can hear me loud and clear, and you can see yeah. my screen, I believe you can. Great. Yes. Okay, Great. so good evening, everyone. And uh, for those of you who, who don't know me, there's a bit of information about me up here on the screen. Uh, I left uh, Cambridge University with a computer science degree in the early 80s and work for a large software house, some Cycon, some of you might have heard of it, in London for a few years. And then in those days, everybody was setting up uh, software companies or hardware companies in their garage or the back bedroom. So I decided to uh, write, some, write some software in, in my back bedroom and I wrote the first version of the question mark software uh, uh, back then, I think in 86 or 87. And I initially thought I'd just get it published by somebody and I went around to various publishers and the best offer I got, I think, was £3,000, which didn't feel like a lot for a year's work. So I decided to set up Question Mark myself uh, and uh, we've grown over the years. And uh, now, as, as Kevin says, we're one of the uh, main suppliers of testing and assessment software. Now, the reason I got into privacy is that in the testing industry, we hold a huge number of test results. And if you pass if you pass the test, then it's great. You may be happy to for that information to go out into the public domain. But if you fail a test, you really don't want that and you want to keep things uh, private. And so I've got interested in privacy at least uh, 10 years or so ago and now quite involved uh, with the Association of Test Publishers, which is the industry organization for the testing industry. And I, and I write and speak about privacy and, and security. So I'd like to start with a little bit of a story about what happened in the Netherlands where there was a court case about online proctoring and since uh, if you're not familiar with what proctoring means it's the sort of US term for exam or test invigilation and it's now widely used in the UK as well for the process of observing somebody taking a test. Uh, so the University of Amsterdam uh, used to give exams on their on their campus but because of Covid they decided that they needed to give end of course and end of module exams uh, with students at home and so they decided to use online proctoring that they weren't using the question mark software they're using another company's uh, 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 software but they wanted to video record students at home and have them re reviewed by faculty to check that um, people weren't uh, cheating or uh, uh, getting somebody else to take the test for them for example the students complained. They felt that it was invasive to video them at home. Why should uh, their teachers or lecturers be able to see them at home? 
that suggested it wasn't legal under the GDPR. And couldn't you just trust us? Uh, we're going to take the exams on honorably. The university's response was to put quite a lot of privacy protections into place. They restricted who could see the video recordings. They only kept the video recordings for 30 days unless there was uh, some issue that needed to be kept for longer. They consulted their data protection officer and their um, uh, did a data protection impact assessment, uh, but the issue still went to court. The students tried to take out what I think is the Dutch equivalent of a of an injunction to stop the tests happening. And I think the tests were due to take place on June the 12th, and the court ruled on June the 11th that uh, the court, the university, could continue to do online proctoring. And they said essentially that online proctoring is consistent with the GDPR. Now. Obviously, any court ruling only applies in the specific circumstances of the case, but it is helpful to set the tone that individuals, organizations, and society uh, can, uh, tests are important for them, and that providing you honor privacy, courts are likely to be, to be helpful. So, so let me now uh, go on and uh, talk a little bit more about assessments and privacy and security. Then I'll get into some of the details about the GDPR. And uh, as Kevin said, we are recording the session, so it'll be available. Also, if anybody wants a copy of the slides, just uh, ping me an email at uh, John, J-O-H-N at uh, questionmark.com. I'd be very happy to, 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 to share them with you. So I think it's just worth reminding ourselves why assessment's important. And it, it applies both in education and in business and in lifelong learning and all, all sorts of uh, places. And so for individuals, it allows you to demonstrate achievement. You, you've done something and you can show that by passing an assessment. And it also allows you to see where to direct, direct your learning. And it's also a level playing field ever since the days of the Chinese imperial examinations when anybody could take an exam to join the China civil service. Uh, so similarly, the best people can show their capability now, even if you're distant and even if you're disadvantaged. And then for organizations, it helps you recruit the best people, not just those who interview best or fit some sort of other criteria, but allows you to genuinely choose the, the right people and also to genuinely measure skill and knowledge of your existing people and potentially reduce the risk of human error and, and mistakes from people not being competent. And it also allows you to direct tra training effectively. And for society, we've got all these skills changes, everybody having to learn new things or some people know knowing things but not being in the right place. And assessment allows you to diagnose what, what people know or don't know and to direct them to the right place. And also we rely on people to doctors, pilots, other people who might have uh, really very critical roles and assessments allow us to check their competence before they risk life and limb. And very relevantly to, to now, uh, assessments also encourage diversity. If you select people on merit rather than some other criterion, then that's gonna make a society or an organization more diverse and inclus inclusive. But if somebody cheats on a test, uh, then important decisions are, are made on the test results. And it's really important to the quality of the decisions that you're gonna make that the results are, are valid and cheating really hurts the validity of the assessment. And so, like it kind of says on the slide, if somebody cheats on a test, then he or she may not be competent, they may not be safe, and any certification they get and also that other people get is devalued. And also, if you cheat on a test, then where else might you cheat or lie? Uh, you kind of crossed a line of integrity. Maybe you'll fiddle your expenses. Maybe you'll do some other cheating. R really, integrity is important to most organizations. And that's, that's a very important aspect of, of test security. And really, it kind of devalues the test and your organization. And I'm sure you're all familiar with Peter Pan, who said, every time a child uh, says they don't believe in fairies, then a fairy somewhere dies. Well, similarly, every time somebody cheats at the test, a little bit of the integrity or the validity of your test program, and perhaps even of society, uh, suffers, suffers a diminution. And this is just such a terrible story. I, I, I don't even, I can't hardly believe it's true, but I, I believe it is true. So uh, in May, a Pakistan Airlines flight crashed, killing nearly 100 people. 
and the initial investigation suggests that the cause is pilot error. The pilots were chatting away and not following the protocols. And then uh, just after the investigation results were produced, the Pakistan uh, aviation minister uh, presented to parliament and said that I think it was 260 Pakistan pilots had used proxy test takers, i.e. people impersonating them, to take the exams for them as they didn't have the technical knowledge to pass the exams. So basically, a few hundred Pakistan pilots had uh, managed to get pilot license by getting somebody else to take their exams. And I, I don't think it's be quite been announced that the pilots who piloted this plane in May were amongst those, but I think that's that's the likely implication. Uh, and I was talking to a friend of mine in, in the US who'd done some lobbying against US legislators about test security. And he said that several years ago, they'd used this kind of argument to uh, legislators in the US, look, if you don't take test security seriously, the next flight you make out of Washington DC might be a by pilot who's not uh, passed their exams, but I, I don't think they ever seriously thought it, thought it would happen. And this is really a very, very shocking uh, story. Unfortunately, it's not just in developing countries that uh, test uh, security lapses happen. Here's a couple of UK examples. Uh, in uh, a few years ago, there used to be a, a construction health and safety exam that everybody had to pass before they could go onto a building site. And some centers were caught rigging these exams so that people could go on sites even though they didn't know the health and safety things. And then just last year, there was a scandal again found by the BBC with undercover reporting that uh, gangs were helping candidates who didn't know uh, the citizenship rules uh, to be able to pass tests in spite of not, not doing that. So test security really does matter and makes a difference. But I don't think that means that we just ignore all privacy concerns and just put in the best possible technology that, that we can do. Because I think test takers, most test takers are honest, and they have uh, genuine privacy concerns. Like I mentioned at the beginning, if I fail my test, who will find out? They might be worried. I mean, the, the people are videoing their private space. Exams are stressful times. A stranger will see me at a time of stress. Why should my teacher instructor see where I live? What happens if my child walks in, my dog walks in, my partner walks in? Uh, we are seeing all these data breaches nowadays. What happens if you're hacked and my video recording is leaked? Does the test but spy on my computer? And some systems do try and stop you accessing other, other systems or see what else is happening on your computer. How long will you keep your personal data for? What happens to any copy of passport or government ID that you record? And if you're using biometrics, what are you doing with that? And you can see that even the New York Times uh, had, a, had an, a piece on this because they were worried about the privacy issues. And, and I think there, there are three reasons really why protecting uh, test taker privacy matters. And the first of those, and the main subject of what I'm going to go on to in a moment, is uh, the, it's the law. So the GDPR, which applies in, in Europe and the UK, uh, requires us to do it. But I think also it's morally right. If you're doing a test and you do it well, then you are, you are really deeping, del delving deeply into a test taker's psyche really trying to understand what's going on inside their head. Um, and surely it's right that you should keep that uh, information private and use it for the testing purposes. And also it's good practice. Uh, test takers who believe the tests are fair and transparent uh, are less likely to cheat, more likely to take the test honestly. And also testing companies can make mistakes. Uh, and so it really seems right to protect test taker privacy. So I'd like to just share a little bit about what online proctoring is for those of you who are not familiar about it. And then I'm gonna go on to talk about the GDPR and some of the things that you need to do to stay compliant. And as, as Kim said, if you've got questions, please do put them in the uh, chat window. Um, Kevin, Ke Ke Kevin, Kevin, Gary, if um, uh, anybody has a question that you want to interrupt me with, feel free. Uh, but I just think we'll take most of the questions at the end. So there are a variety of different flavors of online proctoring. Different companies do slightly different things, but there tend to be uh, two main varieties. One is uh, human proctoring, where the human uh, observes some, observe somebody a bit like we're doing now, looking over a, a webcam. And the other is more automated 
things. So question mark calls these proctoring online, proctoring record and review. Uh, other companies call them slightly slightly different names. So in, in proctoring online, uh, somebody takes an exam at their home or in the workplace, and a human proctor observes in li live while the test taker is taking the test, uses typically the standard webcam. Sometimes some systems have an external webcam as well to look more round, and the live proctor can start, pause, and stop the exam. And if they suspect cheating, they can stop the exam. In proctoring, record, and review, uh, again, it's taken at the home or the workplace, again, with a webcam, but it's automated. The webcam just records what's happening. It can flag issues, but it doesn't usually do anything live. It just flags them for later review. And then a human reviewer can look at it and looks at particularly the areas that the uh, automation system flagged, whether there are two people on the screen, is the person who took the test the person, the right person? And so with our current technology, uh, proctoring online with a human is a little bit more secure, uh, but it's also a little bit more expensive. A proctoring record and review is uh, quite widely used, particularly in uh, the, the education academic sector. And there are, diffs, there are advantages and disadvantages of online proctoring as against uh, taking a test in a test, test center. One of the big advantages of online proctoring is that the test takers don't need to travel. So in the UK, it might be relatively easy to travel to a test center because we're quite a small, compact country. But even so, if you're in the country, uh, that may not be the case. And in countries like the US or Australia, where distances are so large, they can be much longer to travel to a test center. Some people even have to, to fly, fly to a test center. Also, if you're taking the test at home, you can do so at a convenient scheduling point. For example, if you're a family person when the kids are asleep, and of course, uh, online proctoring has rapidly increased during uh, lockdown because it's practical in a socially distanced or lockdown world. It's also accessible for people with disabilities because they can use their own equipment at home. And it's easier to give frequent exams. You have to haul people into a test center, then you probably can't give them that many exams. But if they're at home, then you can give short exams uh, more frequently. Test centers also have advantages. They have typically standardized computers, so you don't have to worry about screen size or uh, different browsers. And also they have good internet access, so you don't need to worry about the connectivity. And there's a slightly higher level of security by having everything under control. It's kind of conventional and, and well understood. So I'm now gonna move on to, if you are using online remote proctoring, how do you do so in compliance with the GDPR and good privacy principles, which is, Kind of what this webinar was advertised for. So I imagine most of you are at least a little bit familiar with the GDPR, but if I can just sort of share a few concepts first. So the GDPR has this concept of data controller and data processor. So the controller is the organization that makes the decisions, that decides what to do with the data, and the data processor is the organization which processes personal data on behalf of the controller, and sometimes processors have uh, sub-processors who work for them. And when you're doing a test or exam, the test sponsor or the employer or the awarding body is usually the data controller and the testing service organization, uh, like Question Mark, one of our, our, our many uh, peer companies, is usually the data processor. And the data controller is responsible for the data protection and the data processor helps them meet it. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the GDPR, but it applies if you're processing personal data, and that includes delivering tests. It applies throughout Europe, and it is included in UK law, so the GDPR will still be part of UK law even once we leave the EU in January. Uh, there's a, if you're interested in general information on assessments and the uh, GDPR, then there's a question mark white paper here, which you're welcome to download. And just to remind you some of the key responsibilities that a data controller who's processing assessments needs to follow. They need to have a legitimate reason for processing the data. They need to be transparent with test takers. They need to ensure personal data is accurate. They need to respond to test taker requests. You mustn't keep data longer than it's needed for. You've got to put in place strong security measures, use expert processors, and I won't read out all the things on, on the slide, uh, but just to mention that one of the things is following the rules of moving data out of Europe, and there's just been a court case on, on, on that uh, uh, last, last week, and I've 
just kind of added a slide into the presentation uh, at the end, which I'll, I'll cover briefly. And just to say, remind anybody who may have arrived after I said it, if you want a copy of these uh, slides, just ping me at uh, John, J-O-H-N, at Quishmont.com, and I'd be very happy to share them. So some recent developments in 2020 on uh, online proctoring, videoing people, using tests. Most crucially, in January, the European Data Protection Board issued some guidelines on processing personal data using video. They will mostly focus on the general use case, CCTV in public spaces, shops, videoing people, banks, videoing people for fraud detection, that kind of thing. But they were drawn up very widely, and so they potentially impact online proctoring or test centers using video to record people. And they were a little bit tough on reasons for using video. You had to have a very good justification for using video. You mustn't keep video for too long. You mustn't use biometrics. So they're potentially a little bit uh, difficult for some people in the testing industry who, who want to use video intensively and put the best security in place. Also in May, uh, three data protection authorities, Cyprus, France, and Spain, issued opinions on remote testing, primarily in the sort of educational, higher education space, but they also had some implications of how to interpret the GDPR in this area. And so the industry body that I'm uh, part of, the Association of Test Publishers, uh, produced some guidance for test the testing industry on the use of video. Uh, I was actually the lead writer for, for that book. It, it's uh, available. You can either get it on the test publishers website or is available on, on Amazon, not very expensively either for digital or printed download. And what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is just share some of the key recommendations in our Association of Test Publishers guidance, which is particularly were aimed to deal with some of the issues the European Data Protection Board rose and interpret them usefully for the testing industry. So the first of these is that you need to identify a lawful reason for processing video data. And the four main ones are that you could potentially use are on the screen here. So you could use consent. You could use necessary for a contract with a test taker. You, if you are in the public sector, you could use uh, uh, public interest, and that might be possible for some universities or UK public sector things. That's how the University of Amsterdam justified their use. But I'll explain in a moment the best one for most people in the commercial sector is legitimate interest. The issue with consent is it's only possible if there's an equal relationship between the test taker and the test sponsor. And that's tricky for some testing use cases, like for example, employees. Generally speaking, if you require your employees to do something, you can't really use consent. Also consent has to be granular. So people might say, well, I'm very happy to take the test, but I'm not happy for you to video me, and you might have to follow that. They also can withdraw the consent and there mustn't be too serious consequences for refusing. Necessary for a contract with a test taker, you might be able to argue that because it's so important to the contract you have with the test taker that the uh, test results are secure and valid, that it needs to be proctored by video, but I think it's a little bit hard to argue in most cases. But for most people in the commercial sector, legitimate interest, which is one of the GDPR lawful grounds, is the best reason to capture video data. It's really designed for situations that include fraud detection and security. You could say it's in the legitimate interest of the test program that we need to record people for security. And that, with some ifs and buts, is a legitimate reason. There are two things you must do if you've uh, got using legitimate interest. The first is to articulate it in advance. You can't just decide it after the, after the event. And the second is that you should document it in what's called a legit legitimate interest assessment. This is a, can be a reasonably short document. It doesn't need to be written by a lawyer, uh, but it needs to be written by you as the test sponsor, not as the vendor, because it needs to take your particular circumstances, why it's important that people don't cheat at your test, and write it down and, and, sh and show that. Uh, and there's plenty of advice out there on the web, including the Information Commissioner on the legitimate interest. And uh, you can also uh, get it from the Association of Test Publishers book, which has uh, uh, an example, a legitimate interest as assessment. But essentially what you do is you identify the interest, you do, which is usually test security and the fact you want to prevent cheating and fraud. And it's very helpful if you can document past incidents that you or parallel programs have encountered because the European Data Protection Board 
such that you can only use video really if you can justify it from past types of fraud. Also, you need to uh, show why the processing is necessary to achieve it, why you have to proctor and can't do it in other ways. Then you have to consider the test taker's interests and concerns and how you're mitigating them. That's a fairly straightforward routine thing to do, but it's very helpful to identify why, why, why you're doing it. The next, so there are nine, uh, nine considerations I'm going to go through. So this is number two. You should only use the video for proctoring test security purposes. Don't, for example, use your videos for marketing. And if you plan to use it for research purposes, get some legal advice on, on how to set that up properly. Also, make sure you've got GDPR compliant contracts with your vendors. Make sure that you own the data, that you're the data controller, and that they're the data processor following your instructions. I think most reputable providers will, will do that, but you just need to be sure there. Also, of course, ensure your proctors are well trained uh, and follow your instructions. Now, ideally, you wouldn't record video at all. If you're doing live proctoring with a human there, you might not need to record the video, and that's best from a privacy point of view. And ideally, also, if you do need to keep recordings, you delete them after 72 hours, which is the European Data Protection Board guidance. But a lot of test sponsors do need to retain recordings for longer. They may have an appeals process that they want to keep them uh, until, or they may uh, need to be able to do some statistics on cheater detection and uh, keep them for that or for other reasons. So if you do need to keep them for longer, set a retention policy, uh, communicate it to your test takers, justify it in your legitimate interest assessment, and put in strong security measures to protect the video, which is uh, my next fourth point. Uh, I'm sure lots of you are, are very familiar with IT security, but essentially uh, it's helpful if you are working with vendors to ask for a 27001 certification, or in the US, a lot of organizations have SOC2. Uh, ensure that any recorded video data is encrypted and has good access control and other sort of obvious technical measures. And really anybody can claim to be secure. If you're working with a third party, you need evidence and, and evidence is usually independent third party security audits, uh, which actually show that they are putting in the uh, protocols or other security measures that, 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 that you want. So those are four out of my uh, four, four out of my nine. Uh, the, the rest to the, the rest. The rest to come. Okay. So uh, be transparent and open with test takers. Uh, obviously, covered surveillance and audio, audio recording is often illegal, and you really need your test takers to know that you are using video. So I think we advise that you put up some sort of message on the screen, even though their webcam is on, they ought to know it, but put up some message on the screen, communicate the boundaries of video capture, how widely you're capturing it, and be transparent about what happens to the video data, who sees it, and uh, other things. And like I mentioned earlier, transparency is, is sensible anyway. Uh, uh, this, by the way, is a picture of uh, the uh, uh, sort of little camera on a, on a pen. So people might have a pen like the one I've got here and be taking a picture of the screen. You really want to encourage a partnership between test sponsor and test taker. You don't want your test takers feeling, oh, well, they're out to get me. Let me uh, do the best I can against them. Uh, there's this kind of uh, broad triangle where uh, people really conduct fraud or cheating if they have a motivation to do so, if they have the means to do so, and if they can rationalize it. And obviously, it's an important test. People have, might have the motivation. Uh, they, you try and reduce the means, but there might be ways of doing it. And what you want to do, most of us are good people. We want to do the right thing. Don't let them rationalize that it's OK to cheat at the test. Uh, so uh, you want to have a consistent policy on test taker requests. Don't just make it up on the spot. If you're consistent with all uh, possible responses, then uh, that is going to make it more likely that uh, you, you will be fair. If people make access requests for the video recordings, you probably have to follow that. But be careful if you record the screens, because they sometimes have the questions on them. So separate out any recordings of questions, which are usually not personal data, as against uh, the video recordings of the people. With regard to deletion requests, there are some ways of uh, refusing to delete data if you do need it. But generally, you want to allow them. 
And you also need to consider test takers who have a genuine objection to using video. Maybe they have a religious reason why they shouldn't be videoed or seen by some of the opposite sex or some other reason. And you need to listen to their reasons and decide if uh, your legitimate interest overrides that or if you, there's another alternative. But it's good to have a fallback, for example, in-person proctoring or exams taken in another place if you can do to deal with those kind of issues. So onto facial recognition biometrics. So this is one thing that both the GDPR and the European Data Protection Board have made very difficult for situations like uh, online testing. Uh, under the GDPR, uh, facial recognition or biometrics counts as special data. And, and for most organizations, the only way you can use uh, special data is with the consent of the test taker. But consent has got really quite a lot of drawbacks. There's this issue I mentioned earlier, the imbalance between test taker and uh, test sponsor. And if there is an imbalance, you can't really get consent. And that certainly is the case with employee. Uh, employee. It might be the case in other situations, like a university student. Also, consent has to be granular. So they can say, yeah, I consent to take the test, but I'm not consenting to biometrics. And they can also withdraw their consent. And also, there mustn't be severe consequences for refusing consent. Also, just a heads up for those of you who work in other jurisdictions too, Illinois in the US has a, a biometrics act, which makes it very hard to use uh, biometrics there. And there've been a lot of law cases recently. I think Facebook just made a $550 million settlement in Illinois was it to be using face recognition without consent. So uh, you need to be very careful about using facial recognition. It's also obviously also a, a hot issue at the moment. Lots of companies have stopped using it and there's Quite a few other laws like to come into place. And the risk here is that you have a subcontractor who's using uh, biometrics, and but you're actually responsible. So be very careful if you're using any kind of biometrics or facial recognition in testing, do a deep legal dive, make sure this is uh, legitimate. And I think in Europe, the only real way to do it for most organizations is to get consent and uh, make it optional and that people choose not to do it, and you choose another route. So automated decision making is less of an issue because although in theory, artificial intelligence can scan video in real time and identify anomalies, in practice, it's not really good enough to be used in prime time to actually stop a test. Hey, look, there's a, a AI can, can detect cheating. It's more can flag issues that a human needs to, to review, but certainly with the GDPR rules on automated decision making, you really don't want to uh, uh, try and use AI or automatic decision making of other kinds of technologies to, and you should ensure a humanism in the loop. And then my uh, last, uh, last uh, suggestion is to consider a data protection impact assessment. Uh, this, by the way, I tried to include some pictures to uh, liven up uh, this uh, subject that can be a little bit dry. And this is a, a picture of one of the moons of Saturn with a uh, uh, an impact of a asteroid or something hitting hit, hitting it. Uh, so a data protection impact assessment is a formal exercise. Uh, it's required when high risk there are high risk to rights and freedoms of individuals. You may well decide that your use of online proctoring is routine and little risk, but if you're uh, it is safest if you can do this, particularly if you're using new technology or larger volume. And it was certainly useful in the Dutch course case I mentioned at the beginning. They did one of those, and it was one of the reasons the court allowed it. So to summarize, uh, these are the key things to do. Establish a legal basis for online proctoring. And for a lot of organizations, that will be legitimate interest. Ensure your proctoring contract is GDPR compliant. Be careful about retaining video and putting good security. Be transparent with your test takers and set up a consistent policy for dealing with the requests and apply consistently. And unless you have very good legal advice, avoid biometrics, facial recognition, and automated decision making, and consider a formal DPIA. And I don't get any, any royalties or any revenue from this, but it, it's a good document, the uh, uh, Association of Test Publishers Guidance. Uh, and so I, if you are involved in online proctoring, I recommend you get hold of that and, and have, a, have a look at it. Also. Uh, gives you gives you some guidance. So these are some references. I 
appreciate that it may be hard to grab the URLs from, from the screen, but if you ping me, I'll, I'll send you the PowerPoint, or also you probably can Google for, for most of these things as well. So the European Data Protection Board guidelines are available on the web. Uh, the guidance from the European uh, DPAs in Cyprus, France, and Spain is also on the web. And the Dutch course case, uh, the judgment there is on the web, it's in Dutch, but uh, Google Translate works reasonably well, well on it. The Association of Test Publishers, as well as the uh, book I mentioned, they've also got a free uh, 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 bulletin on privacy considerations in online, in online remote proctoring and question mark as well as that white paper I mentioned earlier. We've got some blog articles. Uh, uh, you can see some of the titles there. If you go to our blog, there's some quite good, in my view, uh, resources on uh, online proctoring and security that uh, could be useful. So just very briefly about uh, question mark, and uh, then I've got one slide on this European uh, Court of uh, Justice ruling last week. So question mark has been around, as I said, for 30 years. We provide assessment solutions to uh, measure knowledge, skills, and abilities. And you can use our system to create exams. And we've got collaborative authoring, uh, makes service quizzes, tests, and exams. Uh, we provide blended delivery to a variety of devices and lots of good reports to analyze the results. And uh, if you're interested in a demo, we'd obviously be love to give it to you. The Association of Test Publishers is a global non-profit trade association with the testing industry, works for the good of the testing community. It's very active in privacy and security. Uh, that's our URL, testpublishers.org. And we've got a couple of events coming out which might be interesting. So there's a virtual global security summit, which is focusing on online proctoring, if any of you are interested in learning more on this subject. And also, if you're involved in the assessment space, our virtual global conference in mid-September can cover a very wide range of uh, assessment issues. So just before I hand things over to questions, uh, I thought I'd just share a little bit about the European Court of Justice ruling last week, which is a bit of a pain for those of us involved in, in privacy. Uh, so prior to 16th of July, there were three ways in which you could send information, legal basis is which you could send information from the European Union to the United States. So one of those was the Privacy Shield, which is a program administered by the US government where uh, US companies can sign up and say they'll commit to following uh, good privacy rules. The other was the standard contractual clauses, which are a sort of contractual mechanism to be able to send data out of the European Union. And then there are a few other routes which don't apply for a lot of cases, but allow a, a, few, a few cases of, of sending data. And so the, these, there were really quite a lot of ways of sending data into America. But the ruling on the uh, 16th of July said the Privacy Shield was no longer allowed at all and put a sort of question mark over standard clauses. The issue really is the uh, US government uh, security oversight that they look at data that comes into the US and, uh, and uh, potentially survey or are concerned about European personal data in ways that Europeans don't like. So the current situation is that uh, standard clauses have a kind of shadow over them, but everybody's using them uh, in sort of uh, thousands and thousands, probably millions of organizations are using them. And so uh, we're all kind of waiting for regulator approval or those people who are just relying on the privacy shield and moving, moving to standard clauses. So we're in a kind of interregnum there, which I'm sure the regulators will sort out reasonably soon, uh, but I hope they do. And with that, I'd like to uh, hand the floor over to anybody who's got any questions, and please do email me if you'd like a copy of the deck. Thank you very much, John. There's, a, there's some new content in there for me, and I, it's not that many weeks since uh, uh, I, I last saw this. So uh, uh, we've got a couple of questions coming in. If you've got questions, please put them into the question box. Um, if I can just start with one, just following on from that last slide, which is uh, this, the, the European ruling has potentially huge impact. Um, what do we do about it until there's a new regime if we're currently living under uh, the model clauses? So I think that 
you probably just carry on using the, using the model clauses. I think that's what everybody's doing. Nobody's. No, I don't. I've not heard of anybody who's stopping a transfer into the United States. I think one or two of the German DPAs are being a little bit uh, uh, strong on it on it and suggesting they should. But most data protection authorities authorities are saying wait and see. Uh, and I, I think. I mean, everybody obviously has to make their own decision. But for any multinational organization of which most of us are nowadays, uh, we're sending data to the US a, a, a lot, and obviously doing so in a privacy careful way. But I, I think most people are just continuing and expecting that there will be some sort of modified version of the standard contractual clauses that maybe includes a few extra provisos or other things. Uh, but yeah, it is a difficult one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh... First question we've got from Graham. Um, are exams are required for T tier four visa purposes? Would this count as public interest? So that's a good question, and I think uh, it. So, so I probably uh, I, I think you probably need to get a lawyer to answer the questions. And just for clarity, I did put it on the slide. I am not a lawyer, and I can't give you any <laughs> advice for your individual circumstances. Uh, but I think if the exams are mandated by the UK government, then then potentially so. But um, it was actually an issue in the Amsterdam case. The university wasn't sure if they were relying on their own legitimate interest or on public interest. And they kind of, I think, initially thought legitimate interest and the judge said, no, it's public interest. So there could be a little bit of ambiguity there uh, in that both might apply. You might want to put perhaps a legitimate interest assessment in, in place as well. Uh, but it may depend on the specific circumstances. Of we, if you're a government department, probably yes. If you're a commercial provider, then get advice from your government department. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I guess this is one of the the difficult topics: is deciding what what is the right legitimate interest um, for anything that you're doing. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think I th uh, so. I think for most organisations, there won't be a public interest opportunity, and you will want to use your own organisation's legitimate interest. But yeah. for a small section of the community where governments are organising the test, then it may be possible to use public interest. But either way, you still need to follow the GDPR principles. You need to be necessary, proportionate. So I don't think it makes a huge difference to the technical measures you put in place. It just is just part of the legal rationale. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know we've got a number of people from the education and academic community on the call. Um, if anyone's got any questions, either you can put your hand up and uh, uh, we'll open up the mic for you uh, or put them into the question box. Um, but um, just another question I've got is, um, so, you did mention very briefly the what's going to happen at the end of the year um, and that GDPR is just going to transfer into UK law. I've heard in, in other BCS groups that that may not be the case. It, need, it needs transcribing into UK law and that there may be changes. It, is that something we should be concerned about? Oh, well, uh, you've more up to date than me on, on that. I think that what we want is some sort of adequacy decision from the European Union that says that the UK is an adequate place to put data into, because otherwise it's going to be very painful when we take European data into the UK, which uh, many of us will do. Obviously, if you're just operating totally in the UK, it doesn't matter. But for those organizations who operate internationally, and I think that's a, a political as well as a data protection issue, and I personally hope that we make some sort of arrangement with our European counterparts and we do get an adequate decision out of that. But obviously it's all in the political windmill and who knows. Yeah, yeah. Uh, got a question here from Gary. Uh, do the same issues apply if the student sends in video recordings as part of their evidence portfolio? So that's a that that's a good question. So I think some some of the issues do do apply. So if somebody says uh, I don't want to be do a video recording, uh, do you have to make them? And is that part of your exam criteria? And obviously you need to be careful. It's still their personal data, uh, and 
uh, and how long you keep it for and what they ask to delete it. But I think it's, suppose it's a bit easier because they are volunteering you their video. And so not all the, not all the issues would probably, pro probably apply. It's not quite so intrusive. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I guess in the, a lot of universities and colleges are, are grappling with this at the moment that, that this is the first time they've ever had to do online assessment of any form. Uh, it's quite a, a dry formal set of processes that, that you've just talked about. What, what's the best place for them to start from? So I think that you should start with what you're trying to assess. And really, I think the online proctoring is just is just a kind of icing on the cake. You need to make sure that the exam itself is, is fair and right and that you are measuring the right thing. And if you're currently giving paper exams, then what, how you assess on computer might be a bit different. You really want to start from the exam being valid, which means it's measuring what it seeks to, it's supposed to measure. It's, it's reliable and it's, it's fair. And so I think start from there and probably also get people familiar with the technology by giving quizzes before you give real exams and also have a good appeals process. So, and, and be able to deal with things like people who've got poor internet connection or don't have a computer at home. So I think there are quite a lot of issues like that that need to be thought about as well. But hopefully online exams, I mean, I've been working on online exams for a long time, as I, I shared, I, I think UK, well, UK university sector has been pretty good at using them. But the UK school sector has kind of been a bit stuck in the 20th century, in my view, and the regulators have been very, a uh, little bit, uh, not keen to experiment with the new technology. And, and I think a lot of countries do do more online exams in education than the UK does, and often get good experiences with them. Well, I'm obviously got a personal interest in that. So, <laughs> uh, uh, Michelle and Gary, I know you've been watching the questions. Any other questions come up? Um, just, just having a check. No. Okay. No, that that looks like that's that's the questions. So. Um, yeah, it, I, I found this is one of the presentations that uh, uh, you can't, it's very hard to absorb in one go. So uh, um, going back over it is uh, uh, really worthwhile. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting this posted and uh, watching it a few more times to make sure that I'm, I'm doing everything right in my own organization. But uh, um, Thank you for inviting me, and I really enjoy speaking about this kind of subject, as you probably can can tell. And uh, I, I hope this helps uh, some people out there to do get the balance right between privacy and security. Yeah, great. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight, John. It's really appreciate your time uh, coming to join uh, the group tonight, and uh, um, everyone else that's uh, on the call. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, and please do keep in touch with the group. Uh, sign up for our email so you can see what other events we've got coming up and uh, obviously please contact uh, John if you'd like a copy of the presentation uh, or we should have the video on uh, the BCS member groups YouTube channel uh, hopefully within the next few days so uh, with that thank you very much John and thank you for everyone for attending and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next event thank you